Former President Jimmy Carter wrote a book titled Living Faith. In it, he tells the story of some Christians who go on a short-term missions trip overseas. And they come upon a farmer and they ask the farmer, uh, are you a Christian? The farmer said, uh, just a minute, he pulls out a piece of paper, he pulls out a pen, he starts writing, and then he gives the paper to the Christians with these, this instruction. He says, on this paper is a list of names of all the people who know me best. Ask them if I'm a Christian. That story reminds me of Jesus' statement, uh, by their, you will recognize them by their fruits, by their fruit in, in Matthew 7, 16 and 20. Today we're gonna to study one of the stories of Jesus, one of the parables, that's all about spiritual fruit. And this story Jesus gave us, gave us is going to answer for us the, the big question, what does God want to see in my life? So I see three lessons that come out of this story, and lesson number one is this. God wants to see spiritual fruit in you. We begin in Luke 13, 6. Then he told this parable. A man had a, had a fig tree planted in his, in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. Now, when Jesus first spoke this parable, the fig tree was the nation of Israel. Several Old Testament prophets used this metaphor to describe God's chosen people. God then was looking for spiritual fruit from his people, but he didn't find any. God had given the Jews every opportunity to produce spiritual fruit. Israel had been carefully planted in God's vineyard and cultivated by prophets, priests, and the Lord himself. But they had nothing to show for it. They were not a godly people. They did not have a personal relationship with the Heavenly Father. And to top it all off, they were in the process of rejecting the Messiah God had sent them, Jesus. All of that was evidence of their lack of spiritual fruit. Now, the story has eternal significance and therefore applies also to us. Today, we who call ourselves Christians are the fig tree. Jesus comes looking for fruit in our lives. Fig trees are supposed to bear figs and Christians are supposed to bear spiritual fruit. Jesus told his disciples in John 15:16. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Now, our privileges far outweigh those of the Jews. They had the prophets who predicted Christ, but we have Christ himself. They had the Old Testament, but we have the New Testament as well as the Old. Many of us have been planted in the rich soil of the church where scripture has been made plain and the worship of God in Christ has been central. Surely then, God has a right to expect spiritual fruit from us too. Sometimes we tend to judge the value of a church by the size of the crowds, the size of the sanctuary, the size of the financial budget, or the charisma of the pastor. I think a better gauge of the greatness of a church is the spiritual fruit of its people. Now let's get specific here. Talking about spiritual fruit, that sounds vague. What specifically is the spiritual fruit God is looking for in us? Well, the best passage on that would be Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It reads, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
Now, spiritual fruit is sweet and tasty. And so when the Holy Spirit produces his spiritual fruit in our lives, we exude the sweetness of God's love for us, our love for God, our love for one another, and our love for an outside world lost in sin. Now, the ultimate sweetness is Jesus himself. And what I like to do with Galatians 5, 22 and 23, I like to substitute the name Jesus for the term, the fruit of the Spirit, because I think it describes Jesus. So let's do that right now. Let's read it again this way. Jesus is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That fits perfectly, doesn't it? And so what we can say then is that when our lives show the fruit of the Spirit, we become more uh, like Jesus. Or we can say it this way. God wants to see the spiritual fruit of Christ-like character in you. Now, a few minutes ago in our offertory, Mary Pauls played the hymn, and I, I wonder if you recognized it, Oh, to be like thee. It was written by Thomas Chisholm, and it expresses his own heartfelt desire to, to be like Jesus. So uh, Mary's going to play it, and I'm going to sing it for you. Well, I didn't get too many laughs out of that. <laughs> no, I'm not going to sing it, but I, I'm going to quote it. And just so you can kind of remember, oh, yeah, that's where those lyrics come from. I've, I've heard that tune before. Mary is going to play. So here, here is the first verse of that song. Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer. This is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of life's treasures. Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. Oh, to be like thee. Oh, to be like thee. Blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness. Come in thy fullness. Stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Thanks, Mary. Well, does Christ-likeness sound like an unreachable goal for you? Join the club. It's unreachable for me, too. Only one person can live like Christ, and that's Christ himself. And therefore, the secret to a Christ-like life is to let Jesus live his own life through you. When you do that, then your life will produce spiritual fruit. Now back to Jesus' story. After the owner of the vineyard found no fruit on his fig tree, we read in verse 7, he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. The three years in which the owner of the vineyard had come looking for fruit on his tree may be symbolic of Jesus' three-year ministry among the Jews. In each of those three years of Jesus' earthly ministry, God came looking for faith, repentance, and holiness in the hearts of the Jews, but he didn't find any of that. Like the Jews in Jesus' day, you and I have also also been given ample opportunities to bear the spiritual fruit of a holy life. God has been patiently looking for that fruit in us for much more than three years now. Jesus died so we could produce spiritual fruit. Fruit is sweet, 
And when we bear the spiritual fruit of, of the Holy Spirit, we spread the sweet fragrance of Christ in this world that is rotten with sin. If we bear fruit, sinners will come to Christ and become his servants. If every Christian becomes an orchard full of fruit, churches across America will experience revival. Our country will change for the better and the world will be enriched with the gospel of Christ. Now for the second lesson I find in this parable, the second thing God wants us to understand. Here it is. God has a right to judge you for lack of fruit in your life. Disappointed at finding no fruit on his fig tree, the owner tells his gardener in verse 7, cut it down. The tree had lost its reason for existence. If it couldn't bear fruit, it was good for nothing but to be chopped down. I don't want to be good for nothing in God's eyes, and I'm sure that you don't either. But if God can't find any spiritual fruit in us, we set ourselves up for his judgment. The vineyard owner said of the fruitless fig tree in verse 7, why should it use up the soil? So this tree was wasting precious land. It was drawing in moisture and minerals that other trees could have used to bear fruit. It was also blocking the sun from the other trees. Let's take the case of a fruitless father. He doesn't talk to his children about Jesus. He doesn't pray with them in the home or take them to church. He doesn't even pause to thank God before the family eats a meal. If some other man were the father of those same children, those kids might be producing bushels of fruit by following Jesus, serving Jesus, loving Jesus, and growing up to be like Jesus. And so it is that the fruitless father is just using up the soil in the lives of his children and he's missing the purpose for which God gave him his children. G. Campbell Morgan tells a story uh, about when he and his friend Martin Lloyd-Jones were walking uh, in the streets of London and they walked past an orphanage. And Campbell Morgan said to Lloyd-Jones as he looked at the orphanage, isn't it sad to think of all those children in there who don't have a father and mother. And Lloyd-Jones says, I, I don't think it's nearly as sad as you believe. And Campbell Morgan was kind of startled by that reply, so Lloyd-Jones explained what he meant, and he said, in the case of many of those children, they never got their first chance in life until their father and mother were dead. <clears throat> wow. <clears throat> How tragic. And yet, sometimes that's true. If some of those parents had continued to live, they would have trained their children to break the law, take advantage of other people, and worst of all, despise Jesus Christ. Only when those children were free from that kind of upbringing did they have their first spiritual chance in life. Whenever and wherever God sees a fruitless person, he asks the question, why do they use up the ground? Now, this isn't to say that we earn God's forgiveness and salvation by producing spiritual fruit. Instead, the lesson seems to be that we can recognize Christians by the evidence of spiritual fruit in their lives. Jesus taught that when he said, I've already quoted it once, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Now, the other side of this coin is that if there is no spiritual fruit in our lives, if we show absolutely no resemblance to Jesus, we may well doubt that our salvation is the genuine article and thus we're ripe for God's judgment. Now, 
Whose fault was it that the fig tree wasn't producing any figs? It wasn't the fault of the owner of the vineyard. It wasn't the gardener's fault. It wasn't the fault of the sun or the rain or the soil. The tree had itself to blame for coming under the judgment of its owner. And if God concludes that we don't know Christ because he doesn't see in us the spiritual fruit of a Christ-like character, at least in the bud, we'll have no one to blame but ourselves when he judges us. Now for the third and final lesson I find in this passage that I think God wants us to learn. Jesus pleads with his Father to be patient with you. The next person we hear from in this story is the gardener, verse 8. Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. In these words, we can hear the voice of Jesus pleading with the heavenly Father to postpone his judgment on people who call themselves Christians but give no evidence of it. God has already been patient for a long time, symbolized by the three years of fruitlessness in the story. And now Jesus asks him to stretch his patience a little longer. He agrees, with the heavenly, he agrees that the Heavenly Father has given us countless chances to make our lives count for him, but now Jesus asks God to give us one more chance. I've told you many times of how, when I was 17 years old, I almost died. I lost 30 pounds in one week, and at the end of that week, they finally diagnosed me as being a diabetic. They put me in the Stanford Hospital, and I was so close to death that it took me a week to recover and get out of the hospital. My doctor told me while I was in there that if I had waited or if, if they had been unable to diagnose me for one more day, I wouldn't have lived one more day. I, I would have died, and I agreed with him. I remember walking out of the Stanford Hospital after those seven days and saying to myself, Tom, you're living on borrowed time right now. You're only 17 years old, but you're living on borrowed time. You could and should have died, and you didn't. And I said to myself, God is giving me a second chance. And I determined that I was going to make the best of my second chance by serving the Lord with all my heart for all my days. <clears throat> now, many people in the Bible could testify to the goodness of God in giving them a second chance. When the Lord told Jonah to preach to his uh, enemies in Nineveh, the prophet refused to obey. To teach him a lesson, we remember God ordered a great fish to swallow Jonah and not turn him loose for three days. But even after that severe discipline, we read in Jonah 3, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. That's when God gave Jonah his second chance to obey. On the night of Jesus' arrest, Peter disowned him three times. But after his resurrection, Jesus asked Peter three times, Do you love me? That's when Jesus restored Peter and gave him a second chance to serve him. Mark deserted Paul and Barnabas in their first missionary journey in Acts 15. But we know that Mark was given a second chance because Paul later said that Mark was helpful to him in his ministry, 2 Timothy 4.11. And who can forget the Pharisee Saul after putting to death some of Jesus' choicest servants, God showed him grace too. God gave Saul a second chance. And Saul, the chief persecutor of the church, became the apostle Paul, the chief missionary of the church. The gardener in Jesus' story promised to do two things during the year of grace that he was requesting. 
First, he told the owner in verse 8, I'll dig around it. That would give the fig tree a good chance to let the winter rains soak its roots. Christ digs around us with the spade of trials. One takes a dig at our pleasures. Another digs into our family life. A third cuts into our health. Guilt digs into our consciences. Though painful, God's purpose in these trials is ultimately to bring us to repentance and so make us spiritually fruitful. Here's the second thing the gardener proposed to do to the barren fig tree. He said also in verse 8, I'll fertilize it. We can apply that to the enriching power of the gospel. When we read the scriptures, hear the word of God taught, and fellowship and worship with other Christians, Jesus is at work fertilizing our stony hearts so that they can become lush soil that produces fruit. The gardener then told the owner of the vineyard, if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down, verse 9. This request of the gardener is a picture of the prayers Jesus makes for us in heaven. Hebrews 7.25 talks about those prayers. It says Jesus always lives to intercede for them, his, his people. So we shouldn't take Jesus for granted. If it weren't for him, God would have cut us down a long time ago. Now look again at this ninth verse. The gardener says of the fig tree, if it bears fruit next year, fine. See that word, fine? It really isn't in this ninth verse in the original Greek text. And that's why if you've got a New American Standard Bible in your lap right now, you can look and see that the, the word fine is italicized. Whenever you see a word italicized in the New American Standard Bible, what it means is we're putting it in here to complete the sense, but it's, it's not really found in the original Greek text. So therefore, what the gardener really said was, if it bears fruit next year, and then it was, it was as if he felt a lump in his throat and, and he couldn't finish his sentence. The gardener deeply cared about this fig tree. It choked him up to think of it being cut down. That's how Jesus feels about you. He loved you so much that he left heaven, came to earth, and allowed wicked men to nail him to a cross where God would pour out his judgment on him for your sin. Then, if your faith is in Christ, God will forgive you and adopt you into his forever family. The gardener in this story only asked to have the tree spared, but Jesus did more than ask. He died to save you and me. He pleads, not with words alone, but with the bleeding wounds from his pierced hands, feet, and side. And that's why God is still bearing patiently with you and me. On the bottom line, Christ's heart is on the same page as the Heavenly Father. The gardener in Jesus' story has the same goal as the owner, namely the fruitfulness of the tree. The gardener doesn't excuse the tree's lack of fruit or ask the owner to overlook it. He begs only for a stay of execution, not a pardon. In verse 9, he says, Leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Back in verse 7, the owner of the vineyard asked the gardener 
to cut down the barren fig tree. Now the gardener asks the owner to cut it down if it remains fruitless. So neither man wanted to do the job of cutting down this tree. And this suggests to us that neither God the Father nor Jesus the Son wants to judge us. Isaiah 28, 21 even says, judgment is God's strange work. But at the same time, if we bring God to the end of his patience, the Lord Jesus will stop pleading for us and God's judgment will fall on us. Here's volume one of the autobiography of Charles Spurgeon, the great 19th century Baptist pastor. In this volume, he tells the story out of his boyhood of how his mother said to him when he was about seven years old, Charles, if on the judgment day God condemns you because you never believed in Jesus, you're going to hear a voice from in back of you, coming over your shoulder, saying, Amen, Lord. And it will be my voice, his mother said. Years later, Spurgeon would say that that statement by his mother cut him very deeply into his heart. But in the same way, if you and I are cut off from God, we won't have a savior to complain that it was unfair. Instead, he will say, amen to the divine verdict. Now, <clears throat> the intriguing thing about Jesus' story is that it has no ending. We're left wondering, did the tree bear the fruit the next year and survive? Or was it cut down? The Bible doesn't answer that question. In the case of the Jews, however, history does reveal the conclusion to the story. Their final year of grace actually lasted about 40 years, that's typical of God, from A.D. 30, when Jesus told this story of the fruitless fig tree, to A.D. 70, when the Romans, under the military commander Titus, destroyed the capital city of Jerusalem, leveled the sacred temple, and Israel ceased to exist as a nation. That was their period of probation, and they failed it. During that time, God spaded and fertilized the Jewish people with the sacrificial death and glorious resurrection of Christ, the preaching of the gospel all over the world, and the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. But none of those things made any difference to the Jews. They continued in their unbelief, and so the acts of God fell when the Romans overthrew Jerusalem in A.D. 70. <clears throat> in our case, the story is still unfinished. The Bible doesn't record the end of Jesus' story because God now wants us to write the ending with our obedience and spiritual fruitfulness. That tree in Jesus' story had only one more year to prove itself. And who's to say that you or I might have only one more year to do the same? This time next year, our lives may be over, and then our opportunity will be gone as well. Are you ready to slip into eternity? Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. What specific fruit does God want you to bear? Maybe he wants you to share the gospel of Christ with a friend or coworker. Possibly he wants you to forgive someone who hurt you deeply. Is the Lord asking you to give up some 
secret lust, profane speech, or dishonest practice? What kind of fruit tree are you? Whatever type of fruitfulness God wants you to produce, remember this. The secret is allowing Jesus to live through you, and that means you must surrender to his control. You and I cannot produce spiritual fruit any more than a sapless fig tree can produce figs. That's what Jesus meant when he said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing that qualifies as fruitfulness. But with Christ living in us and through us, we can do anything God asks of us. As the Apostle Paul testified in Philippians 4.13, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That's the secret. That is how you can produce for God the fruit he's looking for in your life. I want to close this message with a challenge to people who don't even pretend to be Christians. If you ridic ridicule the Bible, your ridicule won't last forever. If you mock the church, your mockery will be over when God cuts your life down. You may make fun of the gospel today, but it will be no joke when God brings you to his judgment seat. If you had a fruitless tree in your orchard, you'd remove it. So why shouldn't God remove you? God has spaded you with trials to teach you to turn to him and trust in him. God has fertilized you with a mother who prayed for you, a father who taught you to believe in Jesus and gave you a Bible, and the church your parents took you to. But in spite of all these loving influences, ultimately from God, you continue to refuse to believe in Christ as your Savior. If you had shown a little bit of repentance, if your heart had grown a little bit soft, if you had given Jesus just a little bit of faith, you would have been spared. But God's patient, patience was wasted on you. God wants to see fruit in you, the fruit of repentance, faith in Christ, a life that gradually grows more and more like Christ, and a love for other Christians. You can't produce this by your own willpower. Just say yes to Jesus. Trust him as your savior from sin and ask him to live his holy life through you. Heavenly Father, thank you for reminding us today of what you want to see in our lives, spiritual fruit. And Lord, we feel so helpless when it comes to producing spiritual fruit. We, we, we can't do that. But thank you that you've given us Jesus. And as we have trusted him, he lives in our hearts and we can just surrender the control of our lives over to him such that he can produce his own fruit through us and in us. Thank you so much. That's, that's grace. And we need your grace. We love you for this. Make our lives count. Thank you for giving us a second chance and a third and a 10,000th chance in life, Lord. You're so gracious. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.